Welcome to this week's installment of Communication Law, Ethics, and Diversity. We'll take a look at two major modules. First, person of interest. The second, special victims. Before we get into the person of interest module, I'd like to share with you a quick video so that you can gain a deeper perspective behind the case that is before us. And nobody's bothering you, right? Run! operating room right now and uh, they're both stable they're being uh, uh, taken care of up there we've had one fatality that came in uh, early on and the other patients right now seem to be relatively stable we're in the process of evaluating and getting them uh, uh, assessed people everywhere hurts people running people screaming uh, people fear for their life just crying FBI intensified its hunt for a white American man who phoned a bomb threat to police minutes before last night's explosion. I need a voice exemplar. I want you to say into this phone, there's a bomb in Centennial Park. You have 30 minutes. Uh, someone showed him, I think, my demo reel and some photos of me. And so he saw some footage and was just like, oh, this guy looks like him. There's something schlubby and sweet about him. I think he could play Richard, so here I am. You always look at the guy who found the bomb just like you always look at the guy who found the body. Jewel fits the profile of the lone bomber. A frustrated white man who is a police wannabe who seeks to become a hero. Um, I think this movie does a really great job of humanizing the antagonist, played by Olivia and John and Ian. Um, I think it humanizes them, even though we dislike them in the moment. And I, I think it definitely humanizes Richard and his family and his friend circle that this could happen to anybody. And if it happened to you, and suddenly people are picking apart miniature modicums of context and bloviating them to make you fit uh, their narrative, that's terrifying. All right, there you have it, the Richard Jewell case that is now available for viewing. I think most of you should be able to access that movie that was made as a result of that 1996 incident that occurred at the Olympic Park in downtown Atlanta, Georgia. Today's case really brings into perspective, into very sharp perspective, the role of the media in terms of profiling persons and deriving terms that are not necessarily given out by those who are involved in law enforcement. And so if you access the readings on D2L, you will see that the term person of interest has origins that are associated with that 1996 case. So I'm going to share my slides right now with you to share with you some of what might have transpired that would have led to that particular outcome for the Richard Jewell scenario. Now, for the victim, Richard Jewell in this case, who became a person of interest. And I'm going to go back to some key dates. On the 27th of July, 1996, it is believed that he spotted a bag, an unattended bag. And so this is since before 2001 and the post event of the 9-11 attacks on the United States, the terrorist attack. So he saw a bag and alerted law enforcement officers because whenever there is an Olympic stage, in any particular country, or I would say a major city, there is high alert. And so they're pretty much on the lookout for any um, something that is looking suspicious as a result of people who are engaged in the fierce activities where crowds are gathered. And so having spotted the bag, he called law enforcement and they were able to avert further threats um, as a result of his particular phone call. So he was deemed a hero because he saved the day. Two persons died, and I think over 100 injured, but there were no further threats after that particular bag was you know, you know, held and it was detonated 
um, you know, not in the crowd, but they were able to, to, to refuse. So the media deemed him a hero, but subsequently he was labeled a person of interest based on an Atlanta Journal Constitution story that described him as a focus of the investigation. Now you will see that if you're following other stories after the 1996 story, you will see that the police, the law enforcement agencies are very careful in their use of the word suspect because someone is not a suspect unless there is a beyond the shadow of a doubt that they were actually on the scene of a crime or they were a deliberate person there in terms of being the perpetrator. So they're very, very careful with that. And I'd like you to access the full report on d well in terms of how he was erroneously linked to the Olympic bombing. And of course he passed away years later. He was accused because he died as, as, as many persons would have said of a broken heart. Of course, it, you know, he died of natural causes, heart complications, health complications, but he was hauled over the coals, so to speak, in the context of how the media were really engaged in what was termed a premature rush to judgment to publish a story that related to the bombing. Now, the real bomber, he was found years later, he was arrested after being on the run for five years, he was Eric Rudolph, who had nothing, absolutely nothing to do with Richard Jewell. But what the case really showed was this whole notion of how do the major really find, locate, and frame stories on the basis of sources. Their source at that time would have been the Federal Bureau of Investigation. They did not get from the mouths of the Federal Bureau of Investigation that he was someone who was a suspect. And what they got was that he was someone who was actually talking with law enforcement as a person of interest. And so there was no attribution according to the publication. And of course, it was a whole notion of this whole idea of rushing and not necessarily dissecting, ethically speaking, the public's need to know versus the public's want to know. So at that particular time, yes, you had done, you know, thousands of people gathered um, quite a few persons who were international, um, their athletes, their visitors, um, to, to, uh, you know, coming, converging at Centennial Park. And so it was this whole need to let people know that there was someone who was on the loose, who was a bomber. But at that time, they had not established that it was Richard Jewell. And so they actually went ahead. And what happened was harm when it came to the ethical code, the conduct, conduct within the Society for Professional Journalists Code. Truthfulness was also not established because they had partial information, but they rushed to judgment and to publish. So we see some conflations here across the law in terms of what we discussed earlier in the semester in defaming someone's character. Of course, the matter was settled. Um, his name was cleared, but his character was already damaged. His reputation was already damaged. And so for years after his name was cleared, Richard Jewell still was the subject of speculation. People were following him. The media went on a frenzy and it was a very difficult situation for him to continue to live with. He no longer lived in peace. He lived under the public's eye because he was actually tried in the court of public opinion as a result of the media coverage. Um, very clearly, law enforcement agencies that are engaged in investigating people, they have continued to date to use the term person of interest so as to indemnify themselves from possible lawsuits. Because there have been instances whereby when there was the anthrax gear, there was another issue of person of interest, someone who was working very closely with, um, you know, an agency, um, he was named as a suspect. And then he said, no, I have nothing to do with the anthrax here. Um, we need to make sure that we are not naming names and labeling people so as to defame their character. So the need to minimize harm is what was front and center for this particular case in the instance of Richard Jewell and all of those subsequent issues around the label of person of interest. I'd like to strongly encourage you to access the readings and to view the content that is on the D2L so that you have a deeper understanding of issues behind person of interest and specifically the Richard Jewell case. Next, we move to special victims. Special victims here are divided among one particular person who alleged rape 
and three victims of a heinous crime that really took America by storm back then because these were three young women who were actually kidnapped and held for over 10 years and their families and the entire community, they were not aware whether the young ladies were alive or dead. In the first instance, we see here the Duke Lacrosse case that occurred between 2006 and 2007, and the Cleveland kidnapped victims, Michelle Knight, Amanda Berry, and Gina DeJesus, they were rescued finally in May 2013. Now, in the case of the Duke to Duke Lacrosse allegations, Crystal Gale Magnum, whose call name was Precious, she had been invited to a lacrosse party as a stripper in March 2006. And following the particular issue um, and the, um, I would say, escapade, she accused three of the players of raping her. And of course, the, the media found that she had made some early accusations. Um, about the rape incident, not involving those young men, but someone else. And of course, during the investigation for that particular incident, she changed her story a few times. Um, so there were some inconsistencies. In the case of the Duke Lacrosse situation, there were allegations of rape. Of course, charges were dropped against the lacrosse players. Um, they were accused of raping a woman who performed as a dancer at a team party. Now, what came into focus for this particular case here for the major frenzy that occurred was the whole notion of here's a black woman who was raped by three wealthy young men, class, oh, poor woman, she is, you know, sort of helpless in the situation. They might have overpowered her and sex was involved. So clearly that is what would have sold the story based on those particular intersectionalities that were at play here in this incident you will find that more than likely there was public outrage against these three young men because there were issues around whether they were privileged or not and how the case was going to evolve in the courts. Now, the News and Observer did not publish the name of the claimant in the case of the three athletes until after the charges had been dropped. And subsequently, you will see once you follow the readings in the video that she was actually not necessarily telling the truth. The entire incident was concocted. It was not corroborated by the young lady who accompanied her because she said she could not recall any particular rape instance or incident. What actually happened is the fact that she was really annoyed at the treatment because they were not very happy by whatever was performed in terms of the stripping act. And so it was concocted and it was based on something um, purely in her mind at that time, but much to the, um, I would say, agony and the defamation of those young men as it relates to the legal aspects of how reporters cover issues of rape. Now, internet sites, in, in, in contrast to News and Observer, internet sites publish Ms. Magnum's name from the beginning of this particular case and the allegations. In the case of the kidnapped trio, they were kidnapped between 2002 and 2004 by Ariel Castro, and they were finally rescued in 2013. One of the victims, Michelle Knight, wrote an entire book in terms of what transpired between the time that they were kidnapped to when they were actually rescued in 2013. Now, 2002 to 2004, the entire community was thrown into uproar because this was a young, you know, this was a man who was clearly deranged, and these young ladies were friends with his daughter when he kidnapped them. All right. They remained captive in his home until May 26, 2013, to be exact, May 6, 2013, and he made a child with one of these young ladies. So you have kidnapping and you have rape and you have trauma occurring all at the same time in this little home here in Cleveland, Ohio. Now they suffered all sorts of things, like I said, uh, resulting in the birth of Amanda Berry's daughter. And of course, on May 6, 2013, she escaped with her daughter and she contacted the police and the other two young ladies were subsequently rescued. They made one mistake to take the child for a walk, left the door open, and of course they were all able to be tapped, uh, found by their um, your relatives. It was quite a reunion. 
Now, he was captured and charged, but of course, he killed himself before he served his life sentence. And there is a video there that really they're explaining, um, you know, the proclivities of someone like Castro, what would have been in his mind at the time. Um, where was he? Where the psychology of rape and victimhood and this whole notion of, you know, making a child, what, what were you thinking when you actually held those three young ladies? So they were describing those particular types of um, occurrences um, in the video. Now, the full issue, I'd like you to watch the kidnappings, um, the links that are here, um, visible. If you actually copy and paste from uh, these slides that you will access, for those of you who will access the slides, you will see exactly what um, he has been described as, and you will see the readings as well. Now, let's talk about what the Point Your Institute says about media reporting on the lacrosse case. In the first instance, uh, the lacrosse case was seen as a rush to judgment, and the assumption by the media that the three Duke players had indeed sexually assaulted the dancer, and they were working together to cover up a crime. Now, this rush to judgment really was not in favor of those particular guys who were, you know, deemed the perpetrators were seen as suspects in the case and the rush to judgment really caused them like pretty much like um you know other cases that would have, that would have occurred to for persons um to to be tried in the court of opinion pretty much as 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 occurred in the person of interest in the case of of um the guy who subsequently died richard jewel all right these were allegations that were made but because of the seriousness of the allegation, because of the nature of the allegation, that's the reason why it was this, there, there was a tendency really, and there still probably remains a tendency for everything to be seen with racial lens and the whole notion of gender and um, victimhood. And so the favoring of the alleged victim and not working hard enough to determine if her story was credible before publishing is what resulted in the defamation of character for these three young men. Of course, they found subsequently that these young men were innocent because when they did their particular tests, um, the specimen, the, the semen, when they did the, the, the laboratory work, they found that it was not any, it was not associated with what they found in her was not associated with the three young men. Um, you, know, for, you know, first of all, she was not necessarily someone who um, was not known to, you know, to, to make up stories like that. So they had a history of association of concocting stories with this young lady. So clearly, um, you know, the media, they dropped the ball where this particular issue is concerned. And so you will see the point in their column here again on the Duke Lacrosse case and whether or not we should actually would have, should have named the accuser or whether reporters would have come up with their three sources to tell the story in a full, particular light. Now, media reporting on sexual assault, as far as the Pointner Institute is concerned, questions pertaining to whether victims should be named, there are two views that exist where that is concerned. Most media will refrain out of respect for the victims and to encourage others to come forward. Others believe that if you're publishing the names of victims, you're actually blaming them and shaming them. So in the first instance, those who will refrain out of respect are saying that we will actually name the occurrence and the issue, but we're not going to actually name the person because we want to respect them, but at the same time, we want other victims who have faced similar circumstances to come forward. On the other hand, some feel that if you actually publish their names, you're putting them to shame a second time and you're blaming them for their particular circumstance and that is extremely problematic for those who will come forward with similar stories. Now, the general view is that really, there should not be unfair treatment of the accused as it will cause irreparable damage to their lives. All of these particular cases presented dilemmas for news reporters in terms of covering sexual assault, vis-a-vis -vis the case involving the lacrosse guys, as well as what happened earlier in the now, point their recommendations in the Cleveland case with the three young ladies. They recommended the use of clear language when reporting on rape. They recommend that reporters describe charges of sex without consent as rape and nothing less. 
And they also said that there needs to be careful consideration about the details that could imply that you're actually blaming victims. In other words, do not describe what the person is wearing or how they made a choice, as this can be perceived as assigning blame, like saying someone was scantily dressed or they have a tendency to always be walking late at night. Whatever it is, it is assigning blame to the victim. So the language when reporting should be objective language. And of course, if it's without consent, it is supposed to be described as rape. Pointner also recommends that reporters avoid dwelling on gratuitous or salacious details about sexual assaults, as this really creates a re-victimization. Now, for you to access the full article, full article, I'd like you to just really go up here and you will get the Pointner, um, I would say, rundown in terms of the guide to how journalists can provide fair coverage to victims of rape. And finally, the National Alliance to End Sexual Violence, there's a policy that exists and their policy really says no to publishing the names of minors. Policy further outlines a no-no principle to publishing anyone their names unless they give consent to the media. And of course you can fi find a full list here um, in terms of what the National Alliance to End Sexual Violence says in terms of their policy about how we should treat with victims in the case of rape victims.